thank you very much for coming. Again, welcome to our home. The, um, the lecture this week is called Listening to God. I heard uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Th Sachs, a blessed, blessed memory, again, just passed away recently. He said in the lecture, he said that prayer in prayer, we speak to God. And in study, we listen to God. Now, especially today with all the chaos in the world, we need to connect with God through prayer. But in reality, prayer is not enough. We cannot forget that we need to study God's wisdom. We need to listen to all that he is trying to teach us. After all, God and his Torah are one. He has shared with us his greatest knowledge and secrets. We just need to open up our minds and our hearts. And we will find love, strength, and direction in all of God's words. An example of this ongoing communication can be found in the first book of the Torah, in the portion of the Shalach. In that portion we read that Yaakov is returning home after being gone for 36 years. And the Medrash Rabbah states that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, the great rabbi who edited the mission of the first of the oral tradition to be written, before he would have an audience with the Caesar or any other public official, would recite the portion of Vayishlach, some people even have the custom to read this portion after Havdalah every week as a form of protection and good fortune for the upcoming week. Rashi states that this portion is not so much a protection for good fortune as to a directive on how a Jew should act in a Gentile world. Just like Yaakov, first, be nice, sends gifts, etc. Then pray to God for assistance. And only then, war. War is the last option, as it states, better an insincere peace than a sincere war. Now, though the existence of the Jewish nation is miraculous, still, God created a natural world. And for the most part, God tries to stay within the boundaries of nature. He wants us to live within these boundaries. And so when the Jewish nation was exiled by the Romans, the sages told the people that in order to naturally survive the long gullus, exile, they were only to use bribery and prayer as means to survive in the Gentile world. War was only a last resort. You know, when someone says, give me liberty or give me death, they usually die. And because of this advice, we have survived. However, we were seen by the nations because of this as weak and spineless. We were perceived as lambs to the slaughter. That all changed with the birth of the state of Israel, especially the Six-Day War. After the war, being Jewish was a badge of honor. The little Jewish nation earned the admiration and respect of the whole world. We were no longer victims. We were now a force to be reckoned with. War is not only an option today in Israel, it has become a necessity, a way of life. When Yaakov, our father, first came to Lovin's house 20 years earlier, it was only with his walking stick, no family, no possessions. And now he was returning to his father's house with four wives, 11 sons, and one daughter. Yaakov now possesses many herds of animals and servants, he has become very successful <clears throat> excuse me, on many different levels. Yet, yet he's troubled. He hears that his brother Asa was coming to meet him with an army of 400 men. Now the last time that the two of them had met, Asa wanted to kill Yaakov. There were two reasons for this: his hatred. Number one, Yaakov had duped him out of his birthright. And then secondly, Yaakov had deviously taken the blessings that their father Yitzchak had intended for Esau. The lives of not only himself and his immediate family were in question, but the future of the whole Jewish nation hung in the balance. It states in 32a that Yaakov, anticipating the meeting between himself and his brother, was both afraid and distressed, both terms. But why? In the previous portion of Ritzei, where Yaakov left Be'er Sheva and was on his way to Haran, he had a vision in the night of a ladder that reached up to the heavens. 
with the la- with its base standing on the ground. Angels were going up and down the ladder. And then suddenly, God appeared to him. God tells him that he is the God of Abraham, his father, and the Lord of Yitzhak. God then makes promises to Yaakov, one of which, 28.15, I am with you. I will protect you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to the soil. I will not turn aside from you until I have fully kept this promise to you. Great. So, why was he afraid and distressed? Didn't he trust and believe in God? The Malbim says that Yaakov's fear was the reason that he was distressed. He realized that in spite of God's promise to protect him, he still was afraid. The power of emotion over logic. And so, that thought brought about his distress. He was afraid that due to his lack of complete faith, God would not perform a miracle for him. Therefore, he felt he had no choice but to attempt to save himself through natural means. Now, Ibn Ezra says that God's promise to Yaakov was not enough to dissolve his fears for the fate of his children and his whole household. It was possible that Asa might kill them all. After all, since God promise, promise might have only applied to Yaakov himself and not any family. In fact, if we look closely at Yaakov's prayer to God after he wakes up from the dream with the ladder extending to heaven, <clears throat> in his vow, Yaakov states, if God will be with me, if he will protect me on the journey that I am taking, if he gives me bread to eat and clothing to wear, if I return in peace to my father's house, then I will dedicate myself totally to God. And of all that you give me, then I will dedicate myself totally. And of all you give me, I will set aside a tenth to you. If you look at the wording, it's all about himself. In this short prayer, he mentions me four times myself, one, five, so altogether five times, and then the word I four times. There is no mention of God protecting this family, only his future descendants. You know, the story told of a man who was on his way to Rome. He had no transportation, and so he was forced to walk. He was feeling tired, and so he decided to offer a prayer to God. He said, Dear God, if only I had a donkey. Well, shortly thereafter, he met up with a Roman nobleman, whose donkey so had just given birth to a foal. The nobleman had the Jew carry the new foal all the way to Rome. God gave him exactly what he asked for. He just wasn't specific enough. So too, when we pray to God, when we, when we pray to God, we need to ask for all that we need and be specific. Had Yaakov added a prayer for any family that he might sire, he may not have been afraid and distressed. The Chizkuni states that Yaakov didn't know if Esau's coming to see him was for good or for evil. As it says, a doubt in one's heart is the worst possible situation in which to find oneself. Yaakov didn't know what to do. Hasidic works tell us that in man's weakness, he often runs away from situations that God has orchestrated for his benefit. The reason God may, that God may have wanted Asa and Yaakov to meet was for Asa to come to terms with the events of the past, for them to be able <clears throat> to live peaceably together. It was necessary for Asa to recognize the rights of Yaakov. However, Yaakov, because of his realistic approach, was afraid of the meeting. So God made it happen. The Holy Baal Shem Tov explains the verse at the end of Psalm 23, which states, Surely goodness and loving kindness shall pursue me all the days of my life. David Amal prayed and asked God that if through an act of ignorance he were to run away from goodness and mercy, that they should nevertheless continue to pursue him <clears throat> and catch him. This is a description of exactly what happened to Yaakov. <clears throat> the Barbanel has a unique interpretation. He said that had Yaakov been afraid, probably had he not been afraid, it would have been a sign that he trusted his brother. 
And now that he was afraid and still went to meet Esau, it was a clear sign that he had complete faith in God. With that faith in the end, he could be certain of success. A great lesson for us. Stay the course. In the end, everything will be good. And if it's not good, it's not the end. Distress is a greater emotion than fear. So the Raubach states that Yaakov was more concerned about killing another person than he was afraid of being killed himself. In addition, he was afraid that if he would kill Esau, then those special converts that were to descend from Esau would not be born. They included such great luminaries as Reb Meir, Unculus, Shmaya, and Abtalia, and of course Rabbi Akiva. He was also concerned that Esau, Esau's, Esau's concerned since Esau possessed the merit of two special mitzvot, the mitzvah of honoring his father and the mitzvah of living in the land of Israel. Each, each one by itself would be a great protection for Esau. <clears throat> Yaakov had not been able to keep either of these mitzvahs for 36 years. When one is feeling insecure and lacks confidence, you know, the decisions that we make are many times wrong. We see Yaakov in a state of anxiety and fear, decides the best strategy would be to divide his camp into two. As it states in 32.9, he said, if Asa comes to one camp and destroys it, then the camp which is left shall escape. Really? Not a very sound military strategy. A larger force will almost always defeat a smaller one. This seemed to be a recipe for disaster. How could he be so sure that the second camp would survive? And the portion of told us 2745, where the verse ends with Rivka, Yaakov's mother, saying to him, Why should I lose you both on the same day? And there's a medrash that states that Rivka, their mother, saw in prophecy that they would both be buried on the same day, which was the case. And now she naturally assumed that that meant that they would both die on the same day, which was not the case. There was at least three months between them. However, Yaakov, following his mother's prophecy, felt that his strategy would have worked. As we see, it would have failed bitterly. We should always try to see the big picture, not assume anything. What we see as we continue with the narrative is that there are not two camps. When they meet Asa, they are all together in one camp. There's no mention of a second camp. What changed? What changed was Yaakov regained his self-confidence. God orchestrated that he would have the encounter with Asa's angel. It was important for Yaakov to face his brother and resolve their issues. In order to be able to do so, the battle first had to be fought in heaven with Asa's angel. And after Yaakov's victory on a spiritual plane, he was now ready and able to deal with his brother on a physical plane <clears throat> with humility and true confidence. The verse states in 32.25 that he wrestled with a man until the breaking of dawn. And verse 26 continues that when the angel saw that he could not prevail against Yaakov, he touched him in the ho hollow of his thigh. Why there? This is referred to today as the Git Hanusha, the sciatic nerve. This was the only weakness that Asaph's angel could find in him. What does that mean? So the Alshuk states that the weakness was the fact, actually he had married two sisters, something that is prohibited by Torah law. There are those other commentaries that connect the word, kaf the hollow of his thigh, to children. To that there are actually many references. In the beginning of verse 25 it says, but Yivasar Yaakov Levado. And Yaakov was left alone. Now his sons were already old enough and strong enough to be of some assistance. We see that in a short time they will actually destroy the city of Shechem. So they should not have left him alone. And this may have been one of the weaknesses that the angel was able to expose. Especially since this was one of Asaph's greatest attributes, honoring his father. So the question becomes, what was Yaakov doing by himself on the other side of the river? 
What was he looking for? Rashi tells us that he had forgotten some small jars and he returned to retrieve them. Oh, really? Small jars? Yaakov was a wealthy man and he was concerned even for small jars? So there are many lessons that we can learn from this simple act. For example, always double check the area before you leave a place. Simple but good advice. The Talmud Nechulun states that to tzaddik and righteous individuals, their money is more dear to them than their bodies. Their bodies, and not the bodies of other Jews. For Mayor Shapiro of Lublin said the reason why a tzaddik is concerned about his money is simply because he uses his money to elevate his soul. The Talmud tells us that the first question that the heavenly court asks a person on his day of judgment after he's lived is, were you, in, were you honest in business? A righteous individual works hard to make an honest living, so even small things become important. In addition, a person has to give up time that could be spent learning in order to support his family. As it states in Pirkei Avot, it may kemach ain't Torah. There's no flower. There is no Torah. Yaakov had a work ethic. We see that when Lavan chases after him and accuses him of stealing his idols, Yaakov tells Lavan that he had been an honest and reliable employee. He said he never ate an animal. If an animal was lost or stolen, he replaced it out of his own pocket. He worked day and night in the heat and the cold, never really sleeping, only catnapping. He gave Lavan more than an honest day's work, and he accused Lavan of being disingenuous with him, constantly changing the terms of their agreement. Regardless of what Lovin did, Yaakov never cheated or stole from Lovin during his 20-year tenure. Now, Yaakov passed his work ethic on to his favorite son, Yosef. If you look at the story of Yosef in Egypt, it is very evident that he had a strong work ethic. Wherever Yosef was, whatever he was involved in, he was a doer. When the Torah describes his tenure in Potiphar's house as a slave, it says that all that he was doing, God made prosperous. Biyado, biyado in his hand. Action. Then he was thrown into prison, and again it says the warden did not look at anything that was biyado in his hand. Again, action. Even when he traveled, when he became viceroy of Egypt, he was hands-on, as it states in 4146, that he traveled throughout all the land. He went himself to make certain that the grain that was being stored was handled properly and would not rot. You know, the last word in creation is lassos, to do. God expects us to be partners in creation. We need to be involved with honest and true work ethic. I think I'm going to stop here. We'll continue next week with the narrative and all that we can learn by listening to God. And by doing so, may we hopefully bring in the coming of Mashiach Sikane quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. God bless and be well. Have a safe week, a healthy week. Again, with New Year's coming up. Again, bless you all and all your families. You should only know joy. Again, thank you again and Shabbat Shalom.